Talmudim way, adding cultural, historic, and geographic significance to your walk as a disciple of Jesus. Lesson six is called John the Immerser, and the term immersion reminds us that our baptism today has its roots way back in Jewish ritual immersion that was done in what was called a pool of living water, either a spring-fed river or lake or a cistern that collected rainwater. In other words, it's not; it wasn't at all a new practice, and it wasn't something John invented. It was something um, that was very common throughout uh, that day. Uh, this will be the first lesson where all four Gospels, gospels touch on the, the story of John the Baptist. Acts 17.11 reminds us to trust but verify, receive the word with all eagerness, but search everything out in the scriptures uh, frequently, daily, to see if these things were so. And now we ask God to guide our study here. God, we praise you for your intricately designed word that teaches us how to follow you as your disciples. Now guard our minds and our hearts, draw us closer to you as we study, and let us study so that we may become disciples who are doers of your word and not hearers only. Give us Acts 1711 discernment. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. So our synopsis, it's around the year 28. It could be really anywhere between 26 and 30. Herod the Great has passed away. His sons have now divided up the Holy Land. And notably, the Holy Temple uh, has now fallen into the hands of a very corrupt priesthood. But uh, we turn our attention out to the wilderness, though, away from the palaces and politics, to seek a prophet. And the prophet is the voice of one who uh, calls in the wilderness. And we see that as a prophecy uh, from the Old Testament. We find John the Baptist preaching on the opposite side of the Jordan River near Bethany. And this location is significant because it's right where uh, Joshua assembled the, the nation and they crossed on dry ground. They crossed the Jordan on dry ground. So John, John will reference these stones, which reminds us the of that original um, crossing. Uh, we'll conclude with a, a prophecy or a, a parable I should say, about separating the wheat from the chaff. So we'll dig into all this in, um, in our study of John the Baptist. Luke 3, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Antipas being tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And so this is our first time picking up um, a, a reference from Mark. Mark 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then skipping to verse 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness. So we see that Mark begins his gospel narrative here. He completely bypasses the birth and all of the childhood events. Mark, uh, we've looked at the other three gospel writers, so we'll just uh, paint the picture here that Mark presents Jesus as the servant of all. And he focuses primarily on what Jesus did to serve mankind. It's essentially Peter's gospel, and it moves at, a, at the pace like we imagine Peter moving. So a quick fire um, you know, does one thing and then moves on to the next thing. It's easy to imagine Peter dictating to Mark in Hebrew, while Mark is furiously trying to keep up <laughs> with the translation into Greek. We notice that Mark does not have a genealogy because, as Chuck Missler says, uh, Mark is presenting Jesus as the servant, and we aren't generally interested in the pedigree of a servant. Luke, as usual, gives us a lot of detail. He mentions in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Um, so Augustus was a Caesar at the time of Jesus' birth. In the year 14, he was succeeded by Tiberius. And on, on the right-hand side, you can see a coin bearing Tiberius' name. So this places us, uh, if we assume he's counting um, from the beginning of, of Tiberius' reign, uh, that would place us in the year 27, 28. But really, any, any date, around 26 to 30 to start his ministry would be uh, perfectly defendable. Um, there's just a lot of ambiguity with calendar conversions and, and dating methods. We talked about these uh, political divisions last time, but, but now here we have Pontius Pilate in the area of Judea and Samaria. We've got Herod Antipas in Galilee and Perea, and then his brother Philip in um, Galanitis and, and Trachonitis in that area. Um, note what we get into when we get to 
to Jesus' ministry, note the Sea of Galilee actually has three different political borders. So we've got um, Antipas on the western side, we've got Philip on the northeastern side, and then this area called the Decapolis on the southeastern side. So this will start to have significance when we start to see phrases like they crossed to the other side, and that has a whole, they didn't just go to the other side of the lake, they were actually going to an entirely uh, different territory. Um, With this kind of chaotic setup, um, the Jews in the land, and particularly those in Judea, were just very unhappy with being under Rome rule, and, and hopes were running high that God would send a Messiah to correct this uh, this political situation. A lot of scholars and skeptics doubted whether Pilate ever existed. Um, they just thought the Bible was, uh, you know, making it up as as is their bias. But uh, that all changed when this stone referencing uh, Pontius Pilate was found at the theater in Caesarea. Um, Pilate was appointed governor in uh, 26 or 27, and he held the post uh, a little over 10 years until March of AD 37 when he was deposed by Rome because he was so bad. Uh, It's hard to read this, but a a suggested translation would read Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, made and dedicated the Tiberium to the divine Augustus. So we have to remember this culture here was that all of the emperors were were deified and they all had to be worshipped. So again, this stone is the first and only mention of Pilate from an archaeological source. And so we don't need archaeology to confirm the Bible, but it is really cool when it does. So just note we've got two Herods in play here. We have Herod Philip, who's got uh, this territory on this side of the Sea of Galilee. But the Herod that will give Jesus and the disciples the most trouble is Herod Antipas. And he's got really the the rest of the region that we see here. Um, Antipas was over Galilee. And then also, if you remember the map, he was held territory on the east side of the Jordan called Perea. This is the Herod who was the adulterer, and he ultimately beheads John the Baptist. He interrogates Jesus the night of his arrest and mocks him. And like the others, uh, by the time we get to the book of Acts, we'll find that Antipas has been exiled and replaced with Herod Agrippa I. So uh, Rome had a hard time finding competent rulers for this region. This is what's called an ossuary, and it's inscribed with the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas, and that corresponds to the known name of the high priest at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, so this uh, has uh, people's attention. Um, Lancaster, in his commentary, reports that between the time of Zechariah and the start of John's ministry, the Romans began to sell the office of the high priest to the highest bidder. So no longer was it uh, a lifetime appointment uh, given to a Levite. Um, Now it's available for a price, and of course it's only awarded uh, to those loyal to Rome. So this guy Annas was basically like a mafia godfather. Um, He basically controlled, he pulled the strings, and uh, the family controlled the high priesthood between 6 and 66. So these were the corrupt Sadducees. And so sometimes we'll get the idea in the Gospels that all of Jesus' opponents were a single collective group, like the scribes, the Pharisees, and Sadducees. Not so. Um, the Pharisees actually tried to live their lives strictly by the word of God. They, they went overboard in many times, and we'll, we'll get into that as we go through the Gospels. But they really detested the Sadducees, which were just absolutely um, worldly and very corrupt. Here's a couple pictures of the Judean wilderness, the area where John would have been um, based his ministry. So Jericho is is in this area here, and so John would have been somewhere in this region here. Um, on the satellite image, you can see how the terrain changes abruptly. So we've got this kind of line here, um, which is separating the, the hill country from the, the wilderness. So saying the word of God came to John is really associating John with the Old Testament prophets who who received supernatural revelation. Um, In the geographic commentary, uh, the author of this article notes, the wilderness paradoxically symbolizes chaos and distance from God, as well as a place for God to create a new life and order. So just as the, the ancient nation spent time in the wilderness before they inherited the promised land, so we've got John the Baptist spending time in the wilderness before the coming of the Messiah.
And then one last bit of background that I, I find interesting. As the firstborn son of a priest, John really should have been serving in the temple. So there's this question of was he disenfranchised and, and pushed out by the, the corrupt temple establishment or did he voluntarily withdraw because he wanted nothing to do with it? Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, so we're, we're just speculating here. Um, we have some suggestions that John affiliated with another group of disaffected priests uh, that were known as the Essenes. And the Essenes lived at this place called Qumran. And these are the presumed authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's located in the uh, Judean wilderness on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. And uh, just like John, they opposed the corrupt, Rome-loving um, Sadducean priesthood that was up in Jerusalem until they really uh, separated themselves. So scholars debate whether John was formerly an Essene, was he familiar with the Essene, uh, group uh, or just not affiliated at all. Um, one comment is that John and his disciples are associated with and, and at points endorsed by the Pharisees, and this would not have happened if John were a known Essene. So apparently they had some things in common, but to say that John was for sure an Essene, um, we just can't come to that conclusion. Luke 3, verse 3, And he went into the region all around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And John, uh, sorry, Matthew tells us uh, precisely what John said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And really, this is John's gospel message. And we'll find it's also Jesus' gospel message in Matthew 4, verse 17. And it's also the disciples' gospel message in Matthew 10, 12. So uh, note the gospel message is not believe in me so you can live however you want and still go to heaven when you die. Um, the, there is a message of repentance that is very much uh, at the center of this message here. So repent means return to God. And literally it means turn around and go the other direction. Um, the kingdom of heaven uh, is, is said to be both the external state where Messiah reigns over the whole earth and the internal state of the individual who is forgiven and spiritually regenerated by the Lord and then is at hand, meaning this time of the Messianic age is about to begin. So it's a very specific message that uh, that Jesus and John the Baptist are all uh, are all preaching. All four Gospels say that this ministry fulfills Isaiah 40 verse 3. And the passage begins with comfort, comfort my people in verse 1, and that goes into the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And we'll look at that on a future slide. So as you mentioned in the intro, baptism did not begin with John. John was a Levite and was immersing people or more likely officiating immersion um, within the traditions of the Judaism of his day. It's interesting that uh, they, they actually uh, dunked themselves. They went in about chest deep and then bent down. Um, that way results in a lot less water up the nose than the way we do it. Uh, but anyway, they immersed to symbolize ritual purity and uh, a cleanliness that had already taken place spiritually. And, and Peter notes this, uh, baptism not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's not the act of immersion that cleanses. The individual must have already confessed and repented. And then comes the ritual immersion, which is an outward sign of an inward change. And it's interesting that uh, Jewish tradition holds that Adam and Eve immersed themselves in one of the rivers that flowed out of Eden to demonstrate their repentance before God um, after being kicked out of the garden. So as the gospel writers tend to do, they aren't quoting a passage directly. So Mark says, uh, as is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So you can search the Bible and you will never find those exact words in Isaiah or anywhere else. So what Mark is doing is called a midrash. And uh, that means something searched. And it occurred to me that kids today might call this a mashup, which kind of sounds like midrash. So um, what a midrash is, is it links separate passages through a common theme or a common word. And a more obvious example, more familiar to us, might be when Jesus says the two greatest commandments are, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might, and then you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He is midrashically connecting Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 9.8 
uh, 1918, um, on the common word, and you shall love, which is only one word in Hebrew. So here Mark is connecting, behold, I send a messenger, and the mention of prepare and weigh in Exodus 23, 20 and, and Malachi 3, 1. And then he's connecting prepare the way of Malachi 3, 1 and connecting that to Isaiah 40, verse 3 to make his statement in verses 2 and 3. So in other words, Mark is saying that John is the forerunner spoken of in the Torah um, in Exodus 23 and by the prophets, both Malachi and Isaiah. So the early Jesus movement was actually called the Way, and we call our ministry here the Talmudim Way. It's all the same way. Um, Talmudim is the Hebrew word for disciples, and as 21st century disciples, we're following our master Jesus along his way. So the way that John prepared is the same way that we are on today. We'll read Matthew 3, verse 4. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather's belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And we can see that uh, Mark has essentially uh, the same uh, thought. So remember, I mark words in blue that are geographic places we can visit today, and we will look at uh, some cross-references on the next slide. So certainly a reference to uh, Elijah, 2 Kings 1, verse 8. They answered him, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. And there's actually a tradition that the mantle of Elisha and Elisha was uh, given to John the Baptist. And so he had that um, and was wearing that. So definite connection to um, Elijah. Deuteronomy 29 speaks of God's provision. And um, just as he led Israel 40 years in the wilderness, saying, your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn off your feet. You have not eaten bread and you have not drunk wine or stone drink that you may know that I am the Lord your God. Uh, we'll get a reference that uh, John remained a Levite from birth. He did not drink bread or strong drink, and uh, he relied on God uh, for all of his provision. So John evidently dressed like Elijah to remind us that he came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and his mission was to warn of impending judgment before the Lord's appearance. And we'll see that in uh, Malachi 3 and 4. So it says he ate locusts and wild honey. And so the thought here is that he entrusted himself solely to God for his daily needs, just like the Israelites in the wilderness did. Locusts could be the insect locusts, or it could be the carob pods from a locust tree. We just aren't sure. Um, that tree would have been available in parts of the wilderness where he was. Honey, similarly, could, could be bee honey, or it could refer to the syrup of dates and figs. Um, John really exemplified Jesus' teaching where he said, do not be worried about what you will eat or drink. And he said that in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Luke 3, verse 7, he said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, and Matthew adds many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming out to his baptism, um, you brood of vipers who warn you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And we have almost the identical words given in Matthew 3. So note the seeker-friendly message here by John. Uh, really did his market research and, and wanted a message that would resonate with the crowds. <laughs> Certainly not. Um, by, by saying bear fruit in keeping with repentance, John is confirming that this immersion or this baptism must be an outward expression of something that's already happened uh, inwardly. When he didn't see any fruit of that inward change, he refused to permit the outward expression. So he actually uh, apparently blocked people from being baptized here. What is going on here? We may call it uh, cheap grace. So back uh, when the golden calf incident happened in the, the nation of Israel, God was ready to wipe the people out. But Moses reminded God of his promises to Abraham, and then God relented. And so because of this, it became fashionable uh, to rely on their connection to righteous Abraham 
as a, a cover up for their sins, which ended up exonerating them from personal responsibility. So they thought. Uh, one thing we will note, though, is the old adage, whenever you point a finger at someone, there are three pointing back at you. So think about how some Christians do this today, right? We say, well, I'm saved by Jesus, so I'm forgiven. Uh, now, if we say that from a posture of contrition and repentance, it's absolutely fine and true. But if we say it as an excuse to keep on sinning, then it's cheap grace, and cheap grace is a problem. And I think that's, that is something similar to what John is, uh, is calling out here. So Matthew has John calling out directly the temple elite, whereas Luke is, is really calling out all hypocrisy, and I think both are true. Um, his location in the wilderness may have a lot of symbolism here, and John is in effect saying that because usurpers are in control of God's holy temple, the true God can only be found out in the wilderness, not in the temple where it should be found. So there could be that going on here. Um, Aubrey Taylor notes that many of John's contemporaries believe the temple establishment was corrupt beyond redemption, and it was time for a radical step towards renewal. So it's not like the people were going along with this. It was, it was obvious to everyone that there was uh, big problems happening in Jerusalem. Um, Luke, again, extends this to anyone who's unrepentant, whether they're in professional ministry or everyday people, and he'll get into uh, um, tax collectors and soldiers. And then later on, uh, Jesus will say that that prostitutes were there too. So um, anyone could have repented and immersed themselves as long as uh, John saw evidence of good works. But anyone claiming to be saved, if I can use that term, and not acting like it, uh, was was blocked from uh, immersing. And uh, so that could be, anyone who acts like that today could be compared to the um, offspring of vipers. And those are John's words, not mine. Now, fortunately, the course correction is pretty simple. Um, John says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And so a common biblical metaphor associates a person's works with the healthy fruit of the tree or the vine. And we'll see a lot of that uh, symbolism played out uh, as we work through the Gospels. Um, basically, in the next passage, we'll see the people asking, well, what should, what should we do? Um, John says, basically, um, he prescribes acts of loving kindness, do fair, act ethically, act honorably. Um, the word in Hebrew for this is uh, chesed, and it's loving kindness. And so do deeds that, you know, let others know that you are committed to loving God and to loving your neighbor as oneself. So again, before... Before immersing, John is requiring that, you know, there's be some outward fruit in keeping with repentance. If he didn't see any fruit um, reflective of that change, then he refused to permit the outward expression. And so our memory verse is an easy one, Matthew 3, 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And as we mentioned, Jesus will have a lot to say about bearing fruit during his ministry. Uh, we say it often, but our works matter. And, and just to reiterate, we don't do good works to get saved. We do good works because we already are saved. If we are a healthy fruit tree, we should be bearing healthy fruit. And if we are saved, there should be evidence of good works. So remember this first, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Our memory verse to bear fruit in keeping with repentance leads us right into our walking in his dust thought for this study, in that Talmudim show our faith by our works. We could have picked a lot of verses, but uh, Galatians 6.10 works. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. There's a whole lot going on with these stones, and I'll get into more on the website, but there's no reason not to think that when John said these stones, he, he was not pointing at the stones from Joshua 4. Um, so just before they're crossing over the Jordan to, um, to inherit the, the promised land, God says, take 12 stones from out here of the midst of the Jordan. Uh, and then skipping down, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? You shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be uh, to the people of Israel a memorial forever. So we'll learn that John was at Bethany beyond the Jordan. John's gospel will mention that. Um, so they would assemble on the opposite side of the Jordan in the plains of Moab, as you can see on this map here. So the people are on this side. John's over here somewhere. Um, and then they're going to baptize and then uh, cross in 
to the promised land, just like, you know, kind of reenacting what was going on in, in the book of Joshua. So the symbolism is very, very intentional here. And so in a sense, it was a test, right? Just like when Moses sent out the 12 spies in the book of Numbers, 10 came back fearful. And as a result, the people were forced to wander where? In the wilderness, uh, wander for 40 years. So Joshua is uh, John here, I'm sorry, is begging his people not to be like the 10 spies, you know, meaning repent, acknowledge that God is in charge, be like Joshua and Caleb, right? Be Bring back the good report. Um, if they did, then they would immerse themselves, step into the Jordan, and then exit on the promised land side of the river. So this symbolism is very, very rich that's going on here. Luke 3, verse 10, the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics, is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. We'll encounter a few tax collectors in the Gospels, and then we'll see that basically whatever above uh, amount above that was required uh, is what they kept, and so they used any means necessary to line their pockets. Um, Matthew in uh, chapter 21 notes that prostitutes are also in this group that came out to see John the Baptist. So basically, John is prescribing acts of loving kindness and again, to achieve the spirit of the commandment to love your neighbor as yourselves. It's interesting that John allowed them to stay in their occupations provided they conducted their lives with the highest standards of ethics. The soldiers here are unlikely to be Roman soldiers because John's ministry did not extend to Gentiles. And so these soldiers were probably in the employ of Herod Antipas. Now we'll switch over to John 1 verse 19. And this is the testimony of John when the Udiyoi sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then are you, Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet, meaning Moses? And he answered, no. So they said to him, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And then the passage we looked at earlier, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. And then this a uh, parenthetical comment, they had been sent from the Pharisees, and that's a bit of a problem, which I'll get to in a second. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you were neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? And Luke just summarizes this by saying uh, people were questioning, you know, who who he was and was he was he the Christ? So note this term, the Udiyoi, we looked at last time, and it meant all Jews, but here is narrowly limited to mean just the temple elite. And so that's why I'll, I'll put this term, uh, the, whenever it says the Jews, I will use the Greek term Udiyoi, just to remind us that we need to check uh, as to who which group is being referred to here. Um, by the time John was writing, it was after the destruction of the temple, and there really were no more Sadducees. So the thought is that he uses this term Pharisees, uh, rather loosely, and in, in this is John, in John's gospel. Now, the Pharisees were never in control of the temple, and at the time of Jesus' ministry specifically, they would not have had any authority to send priests and Levites from Jerusalem. So, you know, the question is, why is John using the term Pharisees when he, you know, the, the Sadducees is probably who he meant. Um, by the time he was writing, there were no Sadducees, and so he, he may have just kind of substituted Pharisees to mean uh, the, temple e, the temple elite. Um one of the many things that I was startled to learn as, as I went down this road of studying the backgrounds is that Pharisees are not always the bad guys. And once you see it, it becomes rather obvious that this is the case. There are some understandable reasons why we, we, we've been taught to think they are. But once we peel back the layers, um, Jesus and the Pharisees actually had a lot more in common than we might otherwise believe. So be looking for those little nuggets as we move through the Gospels. A lot of similarity in all four Gospels here. We'll read the Matthew account in 3, verse 11. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and Matthew adds fire. And we'll look at what that means on the next few slides. So the water versus Holy Spirit and fire, it's, it's as if John is saying the arrival of Messiah has two different implications. For the believers who repent and bear fruit, Jesus brings an immersion in the Holy Spirit. And we might call this group the righteous. For the unbelievers who don't repent and don't bear fruit, we might call them the wicked, the coming of Messiah brings judgment, and that would be the fire. 
Um, we have some references here. Isaiah 44, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Pour my spirit on your offering and my blessing on your descendants. Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and a, and a new spirit I will put within you and remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So notice it's God doing this with the spirit. Joel 2, and it shall come to pass that I will pour my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. So this coming of the Messiah and, and the Holy Spirit with the Messiah um, is all, all prophesied there. The book of Proverbs is our go-to reference if we want to study the righteous versus the wicked. It's, it's very much a worthwhile study. This comment about shoes is interesting. Um, the Jewish Talmud records that a disciple must render to his teacher all the service that a slave renders to his master, except the loosening of his shoe. So it's as if John is saying, I am not even worthy to be regarded as Jesus' slave. And you can see a picture of what first century shoes might have looked like. So here's a picture closer to the uh, modern site, and it's just, just a few miles um, downstream, but you can see it just looks totally different. It's basically just a muddy trickle, and, and you go there and you go, ooh, this is it. I don't think I want to be baptized in that. Um, the problem is that most of the water is diverted by both the Israeli and the Jordanian governments to uh, you know water their, uh, their agricultural fields. So uh, what's left of the Jordan is, is not much today. Um, in ancient times, though, the, the river was deep and uh, strong enough where you had to use a boat to cross um, and so crossing on dry land would have been a very much a miracle it doesn't look too miraculous in this picture but it actually was um, so there's this connection with uh, the water of John's baptism and then Jesus baptizing in the Holy Spirit in John 3 verse 5 we'll see truly truly I say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So once again, we've been talking about this theme where the water is an outward sign that there has been spiritual regeneration. And so remember, we're talking about uh, spirit and fire. One is good and one is bad. And so we have this little one verse parable that Matthew and Luke both record. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Luke adds, so with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. So in that day, you can see in some of the pictures there, they would take a tool that looks like a pitchfork they would toss the kernels of wheat up into the air and the heavier seed would drop into one pile and the lighter chaff would be carried downwind into a separate pile so you'd basically end up with two piles and all this was done on a plateau uh, with you know, pr subject to prevailing winds to help you know, separate the wheat from chaff uh, and that was called the threshing floor and then so at the end the the wheat seeds the good seeds would be gathered into a barn or a storehouse and then the chaff uh, would be burned and you can see a picture of the chaff in the foreground on the uh, the picture in the center of the screen there so um this this we may call this parable the winner or the wheat and the chaff so it's the first of many parables we'll encounter it in the gospel so we have the winnowing winnowing fork is an instrument of messiah's judgment the winnower's hand is the messiah himself the threshing floor would be either the land of Israel or the world. Once, once we get to Revelation, we'll see that the judgment has taken place on the whole world. The barn would be the kingdom of heaven, the Messianic age. The wheat would be the repentant, the righteous. The chaff would be the unrepentant or the wicked. And the image of the wicked as chaff uh, is very common in the Old Testament. In the Psalms, Isaiah 40 and also Daniel 2 talks about chaff. And so the meaning that we believe John is communicating here is Messiah is coming. He will punish the wick wicked and reward the righteous. I, John, am bringing you this good news, and therefore I'm begging each of you to repent and to do works of righteousness. So in other words, John is the fulfillment, at least partially, of Malachi 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when the arrogant and evildoers uh, will be stubble, in other words, burned. Uh, the day is coming, the Lord shall, shall set them ablaze. Um, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a degree of utter destruction. So we see both uh, in the passages we looked at earlier, talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and Malachi is talking about the baptism of fire uh, reserved for the wicked. So our application for this lesson is really rather simple. It's uh, what then shall we do? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So that is 
both our uh, our memory verse and our walking in his dust uh, precept today. Um, it, it's it's as if John is saying, you can tell me you're repentant, but you really need to prove it to me. So John's mission was to call God's people to repentance and right behavior, and that's our job as disciples. We have to do that too. Um, it's easy to trick ourselves into thinking that all of this is just a, a head game and that you know we believe, so God must be really proud of us and, and proud of our decision that we made. But the fruit of repentance is a life of good deeds that reflects our love for God and reflects our love for our neighbors. So just as Jesus instructed his disciples to love God and love your neighbor, uh, we need to follow that up with good works. And, and again, we don't do good works to get saved. We do good works and we bear good fruit because we already are saved. And so in the next lesson, we will get into the launching of Jesus' public ministry. We'll look at his baptism, which is immediately followed by his 40 days of fasting and temptation. So we'll see you on the next lesson. We hope you've enjoyed this lesson. For more information, find us on the web, www.talmudimway.org.